You may be seated. Why don't we thank our music team? Thanks heaps, guys. Uh, these guys are gonna be working hard over the next few weeks just as we rebuild uh, our music team again, uh, but we really appreciate their efforts, so thanks heaps, guys. Um, uh, it's great to, great to have everyone here. It's a bit weird, actually, <laughs> let me just say. It's, uh, I'll try not to get distracted by it, you know, used to an empty room, or at least a mostly empty room, but it's so good. It's been great at the, um, at the Moolap campus, celebrating 21 years, actually, this Sunday, 21, uh, for the Moolap congregation uh, at that venue. Um, so that was great to celebrate that there. They had a big cake, and I had to leave before the cake got cut, though. So if anyone has got any cake, um, you can come and see me uh, afterwards. Um, I want a, a big uh, thanks uh, to all of those who stepped in and volunteered and just stepped in to help wherever uh, help was needed. Really, really appreciate that. Again, we're rebuilding our teams and uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't happen if we don't do it. And if we all, uh, if we all do a bit, then no one, we don't have a few people doing a lot. Because let's face it, we, we want you guys involved out there, not we don't want all your time in here. You know, this is the mission fields out there. But if we all do a bit here, it's like, you know, tithe a bit of effort here because it's so crucially important that we, uh, that we create this sense of togetherness. And then, uh, you know, it's like the 90% out there. It's the, that, that kind of principle. Now, I do want to say it was remiss of me not to say this in, uh, you know, pushing for um, volunteers and involvement. If you are new... Uh, we want you to enjoy being here, being in our midst. You know, uh, we want you to use a metaphor, enjoy the meal without feeling like you need to set the table and wash up afterwards. <laughs> you get me? So, uh, so you are absolutely welcome. There's no obligation for you. Every, uh, look, there's plenty of uh, other opportunities though um, to serve and, and to, to put in uh, to what God is doing uh, in his church. So great uh, to see that. My, um, this is actually um, my first, in a way, my first, sort of full week uh, it, with this new dimension to my role uh, as senior pastor. And um, I'm, I'm happy to report that I've made enough mistakes in one week uh, to, feel, uh, to feel sufficiently humbled. Uh, and let's face it, no one likes being humbled. But here's the thing about humility. I always find God in the place of humility. <laughs> uh, so I might plan to make more mistakes. Um, uh, so uh, my, my growth curve is accelerating and uh, we're all about growth. We're gonna be talking about that as well. Um, now this week and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be uh, talking about some key key purposes that are going to guide our journey as a church. It's really important, uh, as much as we, you know, you can never preempt what God is gonna do um, in the future, and we don't wanna try to do that. However, uh, we wanna ident identify some key guiding principles that guide us as a church, and also that we can look at ourselves and say, hey, how are we, how are we going as a church? Are we on track? Uh, so we have wanted to sort of boil this down um, to, you know, statements that we can say, what are we about? We're about this, this, and this. And it's all about keeping the main thing the main thing. You know, I talked about that uh, last year. I don't know if anyone was watching or listening, but at least I told the camera. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, we wanted to, and this is, this is not something we've just uh, come up with in the last week. We've been, we were, we've been uh, talking about this um, in the second, throughout the second part of last year. And, uh, we, we came up with these three key things. And look, we could have just said, love God, love other people, and make disciples. Um, but there's a lot of kind of elaboration on that, those principles uh, in the New Testament. And we wanted to be a bit specific. We wanted to uh, phrase that in a way um, with a bit of nuance. And so this is what we came up with. We, number one, pursue God. And I'm gonna talk about that today. Pursue God. We help people find God and walk closely with Him. Number two, we build community. We draw and connect people into Christ's church. Number three, grow people. We empower people into God's calling and purpose. Now, like any simple statements, they don't really become meaningful until we use them and uh, until we fill them with that meaning. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do uh, over the next couple of weeks. But today, I'm gonna talk uh, about this first one, pursue God. Let me start with a really fundamentally important fact, and this is something that is acknowledged not just in the Bible, uh, 
this is something that is very much acknowledged in the growing field of positive psychology, which is a psychology uh, area of psychology that studies human well-being, what leads uh, to maximum human well-being and happiness. And one of the things that is identified that what, probably the most important thing is relationships, good relationships are the most important thing uh, for human well being. And that is certainly the case in the Bible. Relationships, love God, love other people. We know that relationships, if your relationships are really bad, if your closest relationships are bad, you know, life can be quite hellish. And yet good relationships can be one of the most beautiful things about life. The, the relationships that we create is kind of the reality that we live in. And so creating Good relationship, building good relationships is so, so important. That is readily acknowledged. Life can be heaven or hell in a sense, in a sense, depending on the state of your relationships. It doesn't matter how, if things might be going great in your business and, and, and everything else, but if your relationships are bad, you'll live in misery, won't you? And yet, you can go through the hardest times, and if you have really strong, loving relationships, you'll get through, won't you? Relationships are the most important thing. Now, if this is the case with relationships with other people, it is so much more the case with our relationship with God because our relationship with God is our primary defining relationship. It's, it's the thing that fundamentally defines us is our relationship with God. And if it's true that relationships are so important in a, with each other, then it's so much more the case. With it. If, you, if your relationship with God is in conflict, if you are not right with God, then there's a sense, in, th th there's such a, um, an emptiness in that. There's such a sense of conflictedness in that. Now, in fact, it's so, I mean, we, it's actually so bad that we readily compensate for it. In fact, we get so used to compensating for that pain of conflict with God. I'm talking about just people generally have ways of compensating for, for this, that these things become like anesthetics that we use to compensate for this deep, deep spiritual emptiness and sense of conflictedness. Your relationship with God is the most important thing in, God, in, in, in the world. Now the interesting thing is when you have a right relationship with God, when God is your God, you can actually then relate to people as people. See what happens when we shut God out of our lives, which we do do that as human beings. In fact, that is kind of our default mode. I'm gonna say more about this in a moment. When we shut God out of our lives, it creates an enormous gaping vacuum in our hearts that needs to be filled, and we then look to other people to fill that gap. So suddenly, I need you to give me my sense of identity. Suddenly, I need you to give me my joy. And it actually causes us to not only not appreciate the relationships we have, but actually destroys our relationships because we're looking to people to give us what only God can give us. Joy, ultimate joy, a sense of joy is what you get from God. You don't get joy from relationships unless you take joy to relationships, folks. You have to take it to your human relationships and you get it from God. It's about knowing God. So when we relate to God as God, it actually enables us to love people and to relate to people as people. And of course, most importantly, we can be reconciled to God. We can have a relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ has done, because God initiated that. God came to us in Jesus Christ to take away our guilt so that we could be reconciled to him. That's how much God wants a relationship with you expressed in the most important event in world history, in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that's basic stuff, we get that. But what I wanna point out to you is that relationships by their very nature are a dynamic thing. They're not static. Now let me explain this. Uh, your relation, for those of you who are married, th there, is a, there is a formal sense to your relationship. So you could bring out your marriage certificate and say, look there, Matt, I, we have a relationship, we are married, right? 
But really the most important element, like that's important, yes, that's important, okay? But what is really important is that you actually have a relationship in the dynamic sense. Like if you never talk to your spouse, if you never communicate, if you never work through things, if you don't share life with your spouse, it's not really a relationship, is it? So relationship by very nature is, an, is a process of interaction, of communication, of doing life together. It often means working through misunderstandings and working through conflict, like that's the stuff of relationships. And it's exactly the same with God. Now, building relationships with other people is clear enough. And there's a sense in which we, with those that we love, we pursue a deeper relationship with those people. Because remember, it's dynamic. You're, you're building something. Okay, so you're pursuing something to a deep level. And it's kind of clear enough. Well, it's not easy, is it? Let's just acknowledge that. It's not easy, but at least it's clear enough kind of how that works. But how do we pursue a relationship with God? Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but you can't actually see God. Have you noticed that? And so a lot of people get confused here because God doesn't seem as present as other people. So it kind of seems second best. But here is the most important thing that I want to clarify. God is more present even than other people. He is more present than other people. You are immersed in the presence of God. Where is God? God is everywhere. He is in us, around us, he is in, God is everywhere. We're immersed, and sometimes, because, you know, when you're, when, when it's, it's such a present fact, it's easy not to know, it's like a fish saying, where is this ocean? I haven't noticed an ocean lately. In the same way, we literally are immersed in the presence of God. But this is, raises a question, why, if we are, Immersed in the presence of God. I mean, Psalm 139. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. You know, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on wings of the dawn. Uh, what's the rest? I have to sing it in my head. Uh, anyway, but you know, it's like God is everywhere. You hem me in. I look, you are hem, we are hemmed in. So the question is, if that's true, why don't we notice that? If that's true, why does God often seem so far away? Even for us as Christians who have the certificate, we've got the certificate, we've given our lives to Jesus and that's valid, right? That's good. But then how do I have this dynamic relationship with the God? Is it like, what's going on there? Why does God seem so distant? Good question, I'm glad you asked. Well, the reason is um, because we have this deeply embedded propensity in our hearts. It's kind of an addiction, actually. And it doesn't automatically go away when you become a Christian. Now, what happens when you become a Christian is that you, in a sense, receive a new heart, like a, a, like a new desire to pursue God. You know, it's like the lights come on. But there is still this propensity within us, this kind of what I often call God complex. It is essentially, in fact, the Bible has a very simple word for it. It's, I often use the word autonomy, this desire to be the gods of our own lives, okay? This is what I call the God complex. Bible has a very simple word for it. It's a three-letter word, sin. Often we think of sin in moralistic terms, but actually sin is actually us wanting to be, it's rejecting God and wanting to be God ourselves. That's what it is. The Bible says if you say that you're without sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. And yet we have power over sin by the Holy Spirit. But I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. This is where the dynamism, this is where the dynamic bit comes in. But this is the thing, right? We have this kind of habit, this propensity within us, this God complex. And it's like, uh, it's like a shell that we, that we build because 
We want to be the gods of our own little universe, and so we create this shell, right? And the Bible refers to that as hardness of heart. It's, again, it's another metaphor, and I'm using slightly different metaphor, but it's like a kind of shell that sort of shuts God out. And God puts cracks in that shell, you know, and God shines his light, and you sort of become aware of that. But here's the thing, and I think this is probably one of the most important realizations of my life in my personal pursuit of God, was recognizing that I am more deeply resistant to God than I ever thought. Even with that spirit-inspired passion for God, it was this interesting thing. I would have this passion for God, and yet there was this kind of conflict this sense of resistance. We are more deeply resistant to God than we think. Our God complex is more deeply rooted than you think. We are such a complex tangle of resistance. And folks, this is why the pursuit of God is so very important. You know, when a creatures that, um, creatures that lay eggs and birth their young out of eggs, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not gonna use technical, <laughs> I'm not gonna use technical language here. You know, the breaking out of eggs, like a chicken breaking out of an egg, they say the process of that chicken breaking out of the egg is really, really important because it actually strengthens the limbs of that creature. The actual process of breaking out stretches, you know, it actually strengthens the limbs and enables, gives the creature what it needs to actually live in the new reality on the outside. And so too, when we seek God, it's like breaking out, like we, God has opened the way, he's opened the pathway to himself. This is the good news. The thing that you hit, that resist, that sense of resistance that you hit, often we think, we hit this wall, right? And we think, oh, God's shutting me out. We feel like this is a wall and God's shutting me out of his holy place. There's God in his holy place. We imagine it, he's got a wall around there. I've hit the wall, God's shutting me out of his holy place. No, actually God's brought that wall down in Jesus Christ. The wall that we're hitting is the wall that we have built to keep God out of our unholy place. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can smash that wall to pieces. And that's a process, folks, and God wants us to engage in the process. Like he wants us to hate that wall. He wants us to break out of the egg, to seek and to pursue him. It's like breaking out into this new reality and it strengthens our resolve. It strengthens our faith, strengthens our desire for God. Some desire is like a muscle. When you exercise it, it grows. And so God gives us time to break out. And he calls us out and he gives us the strength by his Holy Spirit, but we need to exercise that strength. Now what this means is, folks, and this is a really important point, that the pursuit of God is a struggle. Have you noticed this? It's a struggle, isn't it? It's a struggle. God reminds me of this again and again and again. It's not easy for anyone, folks. If anyone tells you that it's not a struggle, they're not telling you the truth, it's a struggle. But here's the thing, the struggle's important. Struggle, struggle. If it's a struggle, don't stop. The struggle's the point, you see. You gotta struggle out, struggle. Because often what happens is that we, you know, we, we set our hearts and we seek God and, 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 and it, it becomes a struggle and we say, oh, oh, well, that didn't work because it was a struggle. And so we get discouraged and we stop. It's like me saying, you know, I want to I get fit. So I went for a run. Yeah, it didn't, didn't work because I got really puffed. 
So it didn't work. The whole point is, folks, we need to get fit. We need to strengthen our resolve, strengthen our faith so that we can live in the new reality. So struggle. I love the picture of uh, in Genesis 32, and you can read this story. It's a really important story of Jacob. Jacob is one of the fathers of the, of the biblical faith, you know, one of the first people to whom God revealed himself. And, and so a lot of the stories of these first people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are really, they're laying foundations that are very central to the identity of God's people. And there's this story uh, in the middle of the life of Jacob. It's this crucial moment where he's, he's about to kind of get his just desserts. And you can, in Genesis 32, you can read it for yourself. But it's this crisis moment, right? It's his life is threatened. And, and we read that a man begins to wrestle with Jacob. And then we find out that the man is this, it's like an angel, but then we find out that it's actually God. And you think, this is a weird story. And whenever you think, whenever you, that strikes you, this is a weird story, it's probably important. Like the weirdness is like a bit of a flag. Uh, weird story, um, important moment in the Bible. It's like this is symbolic of something really, really important. Now this story is really important. I, I've said really a lot, haven't I? It's like really, really important because it's out of that event that Jacob's name is changed to Israel and Israel becomes the name for God's people in the Old Testament, right? So here is Jacob, he's wrestling, this is like a picture of, of him seeking God. It's, he's wrestling with God, he's struggling with God and God enables him to overcome in that struggle. You know, Jacob says, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. I'm gonna keep holding on, I'm gonna keep struggling with God till I see the blessing and he is renamed now your name will no longer be Jacob. It's gonna be Israel. And God's people are gonna be known as Israel. And Israel means, do you know what the word Israel means? One who struggles with God. That's our identity. We're God's people. Oh, she struggles with God. That's what it means. That's what this is all about. That's what it means to be God's people. Yes, he struggles with God. She struggles and she doesn't give up because she's saying to God, I'll not let you go until you bless me. Folks, we're gonna struggle with God. It's gonna be great. One Hope Baptist Church. They struggle with God. Let's go there. Woohoo! <laughs> they struggle with God. Right, we're gonna leave, folks. What we do, what we need to do is we need to leave behind the idealism that is like this cultural thing. You know, we, we, our, our culture is so beset with idealism and romanticism and like this sense of, you know, we've got to get everything really quickly and, and everything has got to be sensational. If I don't have my experience straight away, oh, and it didn't work out for me. No, no, folks, this is the long haul. This is the long haul. You build a relationship over, over your whole lifetime, you build this relationship. That's, God is worth that, folks. He's worth the long haul. He's worth the struggle. Yeah, we're gonna struggle with God. We're gonna go the long haul. That's gonna be great. It's another image that I love, a biblical image to switch metaphors. In the Bible, um, in fact, in the ancient world, um, the gods were often thought to dwell on mountaintops. Uh, we see this in a number of different places. You know, for example, you might have remember when you read the Bible, uh, it talks about high places. Everyone wants to build high places, right? Because they, they had this idea that the gods dwell on mountaintops because there was this sense that, you know, mountaintops are where kind of earth sort of overlaps with the heavens, you know. 
And so the gods live on mountaintops, and so that's why they built high places. And anyway, you know, God, of course, bans that kind of worship and that trying to, trying to get to God, that one, all, all of that sort of stuff. And yet the Bible speaks in the imagery of the ancient world. Uh, this is why, um, for example, uh, they, they would build in flat places, a bit of, bit of discovery channel right now, uh, in, in uh, flat areas like in, in, in Mesopotamia and so forth, they would build artificial mountains, uh, like stepped pyramids called ziggurats, and they would put the temple on the top of the ziggurat. You know, because it had to be on a mountain, right? You have to, you know, there was this sense, well, the gods are in, you know, the gods are up there, so we need to, it's this sense of ascending to God, right? And, um, but there was always this sense that you never could really ascend, no one can really ascend to God. Like, the gods live up there, it's a completely separate, no, you can't, no one can go there, except maybe really special people. And so this is kind of the thought world of the Old Testament. In fact, the, the Tower of Babel was probably a ziggurat, stepped pyramid with a temple at the top. That was the idea of that. Now, it's interesting to see how this kind of thought world shapes that the Bible kind of works with the thought world because, of course, God speaks the language of the people he's, you know, trying to reach. And so, we, you know, Moses meets God on the mountain. And it's interesting there that God says to the people, you can, no one else can go up the mountain. Oh, well, they would have understood that because it's a holy mountain and only a special person can ascend to the mountain. But when Moses went up the mountain, what God told him is, I'm inviting everyone. I've made a way through a sacrifice for everyone to ascend the mountain of the Lord. And so uh, Psalm 24 says, ask the rhetorical question, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Well, the ancient answer to that is no one. No, but it says, he who has clean hands and pure heart, God has purified our hearts through Jesus Christ so we can ascend the mountain of the Lord. And there's a whole group of, working with this imagery, there's a whole group of psalms known as songs of ascents. Who's ever heard of that? Songs of ascents. Songs that they used to sit. In fact, Jerusalem, purposefully, because of this kind of thought world, was built and the temple was put on a mountain. And in fact, like they often did in the ancient world, they reinforced the mountain, made it a bit higher. They put, in fact, you can still see there, it's the only thing that's left of the Jerusalem temple is the big platform that they put there to sit it up there, to work with that kind of imagery. And so they would ascend the mountain of the Lord because God had made a way, God has made a way for us to ascend the mountain of the Lord. The way's open. I remember in 1997, I, I was, uh, went to Sumatra in Indonesia. It's the big island up sort of there. And I, I, we were in the middle of, of, this, of Sumatra and, uh, and, and in not very much of a touristed area, but there was this massive volcano uh, that I could see from the hotel. And... Uh, mountains always look smaller when they're far away. Have you noticed that? Anyway, uh, I said to, the, to our, uh, the, the guy that ran our hotel, and, and it was difficult communicating, I said, can I get up the, that mountain? You know, because you know I love a mountain, right? Can I get up that mountain? He sort of nodded, and, and he said, I'll, you know, organize it. And he, he, and he explained, you know, that, uh, well, you have to leave at 10 at p.m. at night, and you get there in the morning because he said it's such an arduous climb that it takes all night and you don't want to do it in the day because in the tropics it's you know, really hot. And so anyway, I thought, oh, I, I do love a mountain. And so I thought, fine, okay. He said he'd organize a guide. You know, I, I'm expecting Indiana Jones to turn up. <laughs> a kid turns up. Like this kid turns up, here's your guide. Right, okay, that's, you know. So anyway, so... Uh, we, you know, we start this ascent, right? And we're going up, and there's thick jungle all the way, and we're going through the night, <laughs> you know, up this mountain. Through. And there's no paths or anything. We're just, you know, going up this mountain. This, obviously, this kid knew uh, where to go, and there was this amazing moment where we, as we broke through the tree line, the sun also came up, 
And it was the most breathtaking view. And I often think of that when I think about the pursuit of God because it's like emerging out of the jungle because we get so entangled, don't we? We get all tangled up. Who gets, does anyone else get tangled up? You get tangled up, right? And you're kind of, you're working through the jungle. And you get these moments where God just gives you the most beautiful view, like, oh, I see the view. It might be through the trees, you know, I could, oh, the view's great. And God, keep going, keep going, like through the jungle. And you get these moments where it's this breathtaking view. But that breathtaking view is always an invitation. Keep coming up the mountain. Keep, keep ascending the mountain of the Lord. Keep coming to God. Keep pursuing God, folks. We're going to go up the mountain. We're going up the mountain. Who wants to come up the mountain? Let's, let's ascend the mountain. Let's work through the entanglement in the jungle. Let's ascend the mountain together. Let's struggle. It's a long way. Could take all night. But the view is amazing. We're going up the mountain. We're going to pursue God. We're on a pilgrimage to God. There's a whole lot of things that we're going to do that we're going to talk about in the weeks to come. A whole lot of things we're going to do to feed into this. But folks, this is the leading edge. I want it to be said, just like it was said of David, that he was a man after God's heart. That it would be said, One Hope Church is a church after the heart of God a church after the heart of God. We're not just seeking things from the hand of God. We're not just seeking blessings from the hand of God. We're gonna seek the face of God. God loves to give us his blessings. We're thankful for the blessings of God, but we say, Lord, we seek your face. We seek your face. So we're going up the mountain, folks. Who's coming with me? It's good. Let me, why don't we stand together? And as we close, I'm going to get the music team uh, to come up. And I'm going to declare a blessing over you. I'm going to declare the blessing. This is from the book of Numbers. And it's the blessing that God sets aside to be the blessing. This is what God wants to give you. Let's receive this. The Lord bless you. Father, right now, we seek not something from your hand, but we seek your face. We seek your face. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
by your Spirit. And call us up the mountain, Lord God. Draw us up the mountain, Lord God. Father, you have given us power over all that entangles us. Lord God, let it be. You're calling us up the mountain. to meet you face to face. Face to face is what we seek. The Lord make His face shine upon you. Let's just wait in that for a moment. 